You don't want stuff in the gut that shouldn't be debris that goes in the bloodstream going in the bloodstream. So these adhesive proteins are critically important to gut health, biome health, etc. We call the term upregulates or boosts the production and activity of these adhesive proteins are estrogen and progesterone. That means as you lose your estrogen and progesterone and as you get into perimenopause, our enzymes that also intracrinologically produce progesterone all over the place, they're waning because so much of our overall health is waning. We have so many chemicals in our body. When we don't have enough hormone, after a meal when the gut opens without enough hormone, it can't close back together again. You know, one thing about progesterone that I think is so interesting, especially as it pertains to, you know, women in, you know, north of 40 that are very likely dealing with an underactive thyroid in the setting of lowered progesterone levels as they're kind of navigating the beginning aspects of perimenopause. Can we speak a little bit to how intricately involved progesterone is to thyroid hormone physiology and why this is so important? Because more often than not, most of my female patients that are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond are also on thyroid replacement. And unfortunately, I think the kind of prevailing philosophy is this is just the way things are and helping them understand that this relative lack of circulating progesterone can contribute to poor T4 to T3 conversion. That is a great question. I just remembered though one other point to say, why are we seeing less progesterone? I just want to add this one mm. thing. 300 million women around the world are on birth control pills, which have as of July 2023, became available OTC. That's one of the worst things that has happened to young women ever, to be able to walk in and buy endocrine-disrupting forms of estrogen and progesterone over the counter. So birth control pills turn off your hormones. They castrate you. They castrate you. You're not getting those emails. And we all know there's not one study that shows that women who take birth control pills don't have an increased incidence of breast cancer. And those duration studies is how long does that increased risk occur when you go off of them? We've only done them for women on oral contraceptives for five years. For another five years, they still have a heightened risk. But many women come into me, I specialize in breast cancer patients now since, I won't go into all that, but um, many of my women that have that are dealing with breast cancer have a history of being on long-term hormones, uh, uh, oral contraceptives, and their hormones are turned off. So the protection of hormones is turned off. So another women don't get that pregnancy hormone is turned off when you're on birth control pills. Okay. So going into your question with progesterone, what, what was the question? I was oh, so help. focused on making sure I said that I forgot what you No, asked. no, no. And it's such an important okay. distinction. I know when I interviewed uh, Dr. Felice Gurr, she talked about oral contraceptives being so disruptive and, and for full uh. admittance, I was on the pill because I had latent undiagnosed PCOS. I was one uh -huh. of those thin phenotype. And so I tell everyone for full disclosure, I pass no judgment, but from late teens into right when I got married. So I was on oral contraceptives for a long period of time without realizing all of the potential long-term side effects. We were kind of speaking around the physiology of lower levels of progesterone and how that impacts thyroid function, how I'm that's seeing right, that's right. clinical practice so many women that are developing not only latent hypothyroidism, but also Hashimoto's and that interrelationship between autoimmunity as well with progesterone. Excellent question. Well, we just went through a short little physiology class where we said a hormone is made and it goes in the bloodstream seeking out a receptor on a target tissue and progesterone helps thyroid find its target tissue. And progesterone helps the active form of thyroid, which is triiodothyronine or T3, the nickname T3, because there's three molecules of iodine. Progesterone is thyroid's one of thyroid's best buddies. And it nudges thyroid into its binding pocket domain so it can signal. So there is this intimate, intimate relationship. Um, in fact, in birth, the first trimester, the fetus doesn't make thyroid and it depends on the mom's own thyroid. And I think that we have progesterone to sustain the pregnancy, but we also have progesterone to help mom's T3 nestle on into the developing thyroid receptors in the fetus. So this was its action in utero or in the first 
womb room, and then it continues to have this physiologic action later on. Now, I interviewed on my podcast, um, Barbara Demenu, who was a scientist from the Sorbonne in France, in Paris, and she wrote a book called Toxic Cocktail, and it's how endocrine disruptors, one of the biggest organs that they assault is the thyroid. And Dr. David Brownstein was stating that he guesstimates that 60 to 80 to 90% of people are hypothyroid or thyroid dysfunctional, you might say, today, because we have so many chemicals that affect the ability in multiple points in thyroid physiology, the production of it, the transport of it, and the ability of it to go into that binding pocket and signal. And also endocrine disruptors, when they affect progesterone, they indirectly affect thyroid. So all the hormones are a family. I just actually heard a lecture by a really intelligent physician, and she was saying, oh, each hormone just has its own receptor, and no hormone can signal somebody else's receptor. And that's not accurate at all. There's They're very slutty molecules. <laughs> and there's a lot of interplay between nuclear family hormone the nuclear receptor hormone family. So cortisol can sit on any receptor. And if you have a lot of stress in your life, you're going through a lawsuit, you're going through a divorce, somebody just served you divorce papers at your door and you weren't expecting it. God forbid you have a child that's in a horrific situation. You secrete lots of cortisol and it's the most bully hormone we have because it's it and it will sit on other receptors and no other hormone can get in into that binding pocket. Cortisol will completely take up those binding pockets. But thyroid can sit on other receptors and other receptors can sit on thyroid. So a healthy practitioner will have a healthy understanding that all hormones need to be assessed to get patients' hormones working optimally. And there's a tremendous interplay between progesterone and thyroid, and they're both very vulnerable to endocrine disruption. So we are seeing an increase in all hormonal issues. So we're seeing hypothyroidism. One of the reasons we're seeing so much autoimmune disease of the thyroid, so autoimmune thyroiditis, I think is because of the endocrine disruptors that are in our foods. We have a lot of bromide, which the USDA uh, just put out about a month ago that they were going to remove bromide out of flour because we put we used to put iodine to make flour more stable and so forth. But now we used for the past so many years bromide and in water we put fluoride and both bromide and fluoride will compete where iodine should sit and every single binding domain of hormones is thirsty, thirsty, thirsty for adequate iodine to make that hormone be able to deliver that all-important email. So we are living in a scenario where we're just rinsing iodine out of our bodies from our unhealthy food that we have all these additives in, and then also the fluoride that we've now put in our water. It maybe had some, I don't know, there's a lot of, I don't think when in medicine, it's always risk versus benefit. And I don't think the benefits of fluoride are better than the risks that we have now caused. In fact, JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, came out with an article just uh, two, three months ago where they measured um, the amount of bromide in pregnant women's urine and, um, and the amount of iodine and they were able to show that women who had a lot of bromide, which you get using wheat that's not organic, and um, most much of our, uh, if you get certain um, sodas, I don't know exactly which sodas, but they add bromide to stabilize some of the citrus flavors. So there's certain sodas, a lot of sodas have bromide in them. They were able to show that the more bromide and the more that iodine couldn't be held in the body, at three years old, when they tested the children, those were the kids that had ADHD and Asperger's syndrome because your whole brain is under the influence of healthy hormones. Hormones rule your brain, but especially the thyroid has a lot to do with IQ and thinking. And um, if you're rinsing out iodine and so your thyroid hormone doesn't work well, it's made up of iodine molecules, and now you've learned that iodine is necessary in every single binding domain or otherwise hormones don't work, 
our children are showing up illnesses that have a lot to do with not being able to have enough iodine present. Our old, our um, recommended daily allowance of iodine is based on 50 year old data that was based on prevention of iodine just to not get a goiter, which it, you get extra growth of the thyroid gland if you have insufficient iodine, but there wasn't near as much bromide and fluoride and other chemicals in our environment 50 years ago as there is now. So a lot of autoimmune thyroiditis, as much as this goes against many people's fear of, we have a lot of iodophobics uh, circulating because some people are inappropriately making patients frightened of iodine. And iodine is a detoxifier. It really helps you detoxify a lot of these chemicals. And the other thing is we have ways that we combat cancer inside our body. And one of the biggest ways is the final metabolite of estrogen. So estrogen is made and then it's broken down and broken down. And those broken down pieces are called metabolites. So you get the parent estrogen, which makes the kid estrogen and the grandkid estrogen. And the grandkid estrogens, which are the methylated final metabolites of estrogen in both men and women, make something that looks exactly like a chemotherapeutic drug. And it is our own, we call it endogenous, our own homemade anti-cancer drug. But if you don't have iodine, it won't make it. Or if you can't methylate, it also won't make it. But you need iodine to protect yourself from cancer. And we have less and less iodine and more chemicals rinse iodine out of the body. And um, that's something that's not well appreciated. So we often give autoimmune thyroid patients robust amounts of iodine, but we also always look at the gut. The, the epicenter often of autoimmune disease starts in the gut, and there's many things to do. I mean, Many, many cases, you never can guarantee anyone anything, but many cases of MS, RA, a mixed mucosal collagen disease, all kinds of autoimmune diseases, which all mean that the immune system is on overdrive. A lot of those things you can help with fixing the gut and also giving robust amounts of iodine. So please don't be one of the iotophobics that is missing out on what you actually really need to help maintain healthy hormones. Well, I'm glad that you touched on iodine because I do feel like it tends to be a very controversial topic with even within the functional integrative medicine space. And so sometimes we will get questions. And I know Dr. Brownstein has a great resource, a book that's written specifically on iodine and just helping people understand that, you know, this is where I think diagnostic testing can be beneficial to help determine, you know, what someone's intrinsic needs may be and kind of pivoting and talking about gut health. Oh, this just... Can I just make one last sentence sure, on there? Absolutely. Sorry. No, it's fine. Everyone's worried about breast cancer and iodine kills breast cancer cells. So just keep that in mind. <laughs> no, it's it's certainly, it's incredibly important. And, and yet it has been vilified in many right. circumstances. You know, one other thing that I, I want to at least touch on is the interrelationship between progesterone and gut health and specifically these enterocytes. The reason why I think this is interesting, relevant, especially to my community is the changes that are ongoing as we're hearkening the beginning stages of perimenopause, we have less circulating progesterone, the kind of the adrenal step in to help support the ovaries. But why all of a sudden, not only is it autoimmunity, but people are so much more susceptible to dysbiosis, opportunistic infections, and why both progesterone and estrogen are so important for immunity the ability to navigate fighting infection. And I think the gut in particular and leaky gut is a huge issue that I'm seeing almost consistently in every single female patient. You give, you give great questions. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Um, so what the heck is a leaky gut? So the, for some reason, God, he or she, or whoever Maybe there's another gender to describe God. I don't know. Someone told me the other day there were nine genders, and I was so I said, I'm confused. Okay, so um the gut, for whatever reason, made by our wonderful maker of life, and life is a gift. The gut is only one cell thick for, for whatever reason, just one this little gut lining that separates the outside of the world from the inside of us is one cell thick. And that one cell is like really important to maintain functionality. If you talk about functional medicine, all do functional docs want to make sure your gut lining is functional. 
And one of the ways it's functional is after you eat, if you have enough digestive players available, you take these large peptides of food, these large chains of proteins and of different types of food, and with a meat cleaver, you cleave, cleave, cut, 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 cut to tiny, tiny pieces, and your gut wall opens up a little bit after a meal, and they cross into your bloodstream, go to your liver, and then the rest of your body. And then your gut wall closes. So there's an opening and closing that's optimal right postprandially, which means right the heck after you swallow, you eat. So we have little adhesive proteins. There's families of them. And I won't go into, they've, they're these polysyllabic names, like junctional adhesive molecule and occludins and things. There's 44 types of occludins. There's lots of little adhesive proteins. They're so important. They are the proteins that are sticky and they help when the gut opens after a meal to let the well-digested food through. They then stick back these enterocytes together so that you don't have leaky gut and what stays in Vegas, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What happens in the gut lumen, the inside of the gut should stay in the gut lumen. You know, it's kind of a really cool term, but it's accurate. You don't want stuff in the gut that shouldn't be debris that goes in the bloodstream going in the bloodstream. So these adhesive proteins are critically important to gut health, biome health, et cetera. And what we call the term upregulates or boosts the production and activity of these adhesive proteins are estrogen and progesterone. Who the heck knew that? And um, that means as you lose your estrogen and progesterone, and as you get into perimenopause, we make a lot of our progesterone from ovulation, and now we're not ovulating regularly, but our enzymes that also intrachronologically produced progesterone all over the place, they're waning because so much of our overall health is waning. We have so many chemicals in our body. When we don't have enough hormone, after a meal, when the gut opens, without enough hormone, it can't close back together again. So one of the side effects of insufficient hormones is the propensity for leaky gut. And anybody, if they're a young man, young men now often in their 20s have levels of testosterone that we only saw in old 70. I hate to say old 70 year old because I don't feel old in my 70s. And most people in their 70s don't have lucidity and speed of processing like my brain does because your brain is run by hormones and I'm on a fair amount of hormones. And it's very important to know that you can really create a healthier human being if you, you know how to go about it strategically. But a loss of hormones means the loss of the capability of opening and closing in appropriate timing so that you have more debris going into the bloodstream. And when you have debris going into the bloodstream, your immune system says, holy moly, we're filled with gunk. We better go on overdrive and get this gunk out. And wherever the overdrive tissue is the most focus of it, we name the autoimmune disease based on the tissue that that overdrive action. But it's really interesting the way they treat autoimmune disease is immunosuppressive drugs because we all know autoimmunity is caused by overdrive of the immune system. So let's shut it down, which of course, these IV infusions and these old meds like methotrexate and so forth, people end up getting cancer 10 years down the road and all kinds of problems because you don't want to turn your immune system totally off. That's absolutely nuts. Not only is that Band-Aid medicine, it's bomb medicine, and it's not good bomb medicine, but we always like to get to root cause. So one of the root causes is not enough hormone. Let's, let's test the hormones and get them back to a better earlier age level. So we've got this open and closing. And then let's check the digestive system, which is a whole nother, you know, conversation. We could go on and on and on. I have a book out, I, uh, my book, Healthy Digestion in the Natural Way, which was one of the first books on digestion and nutrition and spirituality, uh, came, was published by Wiley. It sold over a million copies. And I'm all, I haven't finished my textbook that I've been working on for too many years, it's embarrassing, but I'm at page 814. It's a textbook on nutritional gastroenterology. And next year, I hope to put on a course, Everything Gut, like we did Everything Hormones this year, because your gut, of course, is the epicenter of your health. But it's ruled by hormones. All along the whole lining of your gut 
are these satellite dishes for estrogen, progesterone, and we hear that gut immunity is the major place where our immune system works, and that's all run under the auspices of, of testosterone. So secretory IgA is a, is a licking little protein that licks what comes in from the outside. They lick it. Is this... <laughs> Is this friend or foe? Is this friend or foe? And it's run by testosterone. And that's why there's 159 known autoimmune diseases at the moment. And men get less of all of them, except for the renal one, because they make more testosterone. So people debate, should we give testosterone to older women? Yes, it will help prevent autoimmune disease because it helps them lick, 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 you know, that secretory IgA. And we can measure secretory IgA now and know the licking capacity of the you know, how robust is that immunity in functionality in the gut? And it's so great that we can do these deep dives, but patients are so much more complex today to get well because our food, air, and water, and also emotional stress from politics to the pandemic. And is the pandemic real or was it a scamdemic? And who do we believe? And should you listen to me or should you listen to some other doctor? Or is there an estrogen window? And it's only available for 10 years after the age of 50. And if you're 65 or 70 now, you've missed out. Bunk, 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 bunk. We can give hormones till you're in your 90s, even if you've never been on them. And I hope to be the most hormonally balanced corpse or ashes uh, in the cemetery or on the mantle. You know, hormones can be taken all throughout life to help replenish the internet system and keep your emails going. Oh, I, I love the the thought process. I will never be able to think of SIG-A again without thinking about the licking testosterone. Now, I would be remiss if we didn't touch a little bit on broad strokes labs before we talk about some of the problems that can occur with progesterone replacement, because this is where a lot of the questions came in. So let's look at a cycling woman days one through 14 versus days 15 through 28 versus ideal ranges you like to see in your female patients that are perhaps perimenopause into menopause that are taking hormone replacement therapy that confer the most benefits to their heart, brain, and bodies. So you mean on all the hormones or a focus on progesterone? Let's start with progesterone. So I always go to the literature. Not that all the literature can be depended on, because understand that a lot of literature, the, always follow the money. And a lot of science comes from people who are benefiting by that science. And now schools are all given grants by pharmaceutical companies, all of them. The Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine was just bought up by a, a lab, a ph big pharma lab. So now they're teaching drugs in naturopathic college, which I think naturopathy was actually the best um, genre of medicine that we've ever had. And I'm sorry to see that it's not sustaining itself because they want so much to be medical when the medical is not serving us. So it's all crazy because everyone wants status and money and acceptance. So who, you know, who do you listen to with all of this? So when I was writing Safe Hormones, Smart Women, so I have 21 books out at the moment. And a, a number of them, though, are out of print because I've been writing books since I was a young woman. And now I'm no longer a young woman in years, but I'm hopefully still a young woman in energetic and in emailing uh, capability. Um, so I had breast cancer uh, 33 years ago. I've been on hormones now for almost 30 years. And I wanted to know if it was safe for me to take hormones. And I had breast cancer because my mother was given the most powerful endocrine disruptor ever invented diethylstabestrol, and the majority of those daughters that got first trimester exposures had breast cancer all between the year 44 and 46. Just a huge epidemic of breast cancer in the offspring of DES, they call them DES daughters. And so I wanted to know, is it safe for me to take hormones because I lost so many hormones and I had went on to have other cancers and I had to figure out how to stop my cancer madness and and be well. And I already was organic and detoxing and doing everything right way before I was getting ill. So it was nothing to do with changing your lifestyle. It was in utero exposure in my mom's womb. So I dove into the literature. And at that time, so that book was published in 2010. And I started doing the research. It took me 
six years to write Hormone Deception because nobody had ever heard of endocrine disruption then. And it took me three years to write Safe Hormone Smart Women. And in those three years, I was published in 2010. So um, from 2007 to 2010, in the literature, there were about 100 studies where they looked at preoperative levels of progesterone and women that were going in for breast cancer surgery compared to match cohorts to women who had breast cancer surgery with lower levels of progesterone, high and low levels they looked at. And then they followed them in many of these studies. It was extraordinary how many studies there were along this line to see who went on to get a recurrence and who went on to live through that recurrence or die from that recurrence. And there was a theme and it was a very established theme. The women who had the highest level of progesterone close to the luteal phase, which meant that it was between five and six nanograms per milliliter, those women compared to women who had follicular levels, which were much lower than that, those women lived longer, had less recurrence and less death if they had recurrence. Sign me up. That's what I want. We all want to be safe. We all want to be healthy. We all want to be as good as we can be for as long as we can be, right? That's what we're looking at. So there were now, if you look for those studies, the majority of these studies are gone. They're buried. They were in PubMed, but Big Pharma has buried a lot of the old time studies and it's very hard to find them, but there you can find some of them. And I had to go back in through old articles that cited some of these studies to find them. It was really shocking how much when we Google something online, you don't realize how much Big Pharma has bought the first 100 pages of that Google search. So it's very, if you go to Mr. Google, Dr. Google, it's very hard to get an accurate answer. But there was lots of research on this. Carol and I were talking about this in Everything Hormones. She's the main pharmacist at Women's Health International, which is one of the major women's compounding pharmacies in Wisconsin. So we know that the more progesterone you have in your bloodstream, the better breast protection you have. And we want that. And we don't mean you should have excessive excessive levels, but the level should be somewhere between five nanograms per milliliter. And then if you have a history of glandular disease like chronic cystic mastitis, chronic lumpy, bumpy breast. You had a biopsy and you had dysplastic cells. You, you had breast cancer. Um, if you had endometriosis, if you had PCOS, if you had adenomyosis, you need a lot of progesterone because there's a condition called progesterone resistance where you take in progesterone, but it can't signal. And a lot of these diseases are actually caused by progesterone resistance. And the way you overcome it is by giving more progesterone. So I like keeping women with those histories. So I like keeping my own personal level of progesterone around 20 nanograms per milliliter because I had endometri all the DES daughters exposed in utero first trimester had adenomyosis, endometriosis, breast cancer, <clears throat> and a variety of other issues. And now the granddaughters, one, several granddaughters have had ovarian cancer at eight years old. I mean, it's, it, all these issues are transgenerational. They're passed on even if the exposures don't continue, but we now know the exposures are enhancing. So I translated that science into levels I like to see. I hope this wasn't too long to get to the answer for you. I hope I'm not being too circuitous. Um, I like to see women at least at five nanograms per milliliter. And you should be, if you're using topical, you should apply it like an hour before the test and then take the test within an hour that you get whichever. And I, I use serum now. I've gone through every reiteration. I've done 24-hour urines. I've done spot this. I've done salivary. At the moment, what we taught in everything hormones was serum and serum interpretation. And I think you can do a real lot with blood. And even if you do use urine like Dutch test, you still have to follow follicle stimulating hormone and sex hormone binding globulin and things like that in the blood. So you cannot get away from needing blood tests added to whatever way you're assessing your hormones. You've got to do some serum, which is blood testing. So um, <clears throat> that's a great way to understand how much protection the progesterone is giving to the body enough to the uterus, to the breast, but also you make it remember the brain and all your insula insulation for your nerves and also the repair of your lungs. Why do pe old people, I hate that term, <laughs> why do old people get more um, pneumonia? Because they have less progesterone. 
It progesterone protects the lungs from the first assault, and then it helps them repair from that assault. We saw that in the Mount Sinai COVID studies. So we even use progesterone now in men. We don't deny men progesterone because they need it, just not in the same doses, but some men need similar doses to what the women get. And it used to be thought, according to the work of John Lee, <clears throat> who's kind of considered the father of progesterone. I had the honor of lecturing with him and David Zava that runs uh, ZRT Saliva Labs. We lectured to 6,000 people in a football stadium in Arizona. It was like a crazy day all day long. And he went on to help write one of the introductions for me to hormone deception. He was a lovely man and unfortunately died from an accident. It was a big loss. But he said that a premenopausal woman only makes about 20 milligrams a day of progesterone. So we thought you don't need very much progesterone to achieve protection. And that has since been found not to be true at all. He was the father of progesterone, but he didn't have his dosing right. Nobody's got everything right. And that was one of the things in his beautiful, incredible brain of so much gifts that he gave us. The dosing wasn't one of the gifts that he gave us and it took us on the wrong path. And also some people say, that you only make progesterone the second half of the month. So you only need to replace it, especially if you're looking at hormone replacement as you age the second half of the month. No, no, no. You've just learned that we, your adrenal glands make progesterone the first two weeks of the month, that your corpus luteum that makes it the second two weeks, and you have enzymes all over the body that aren't going to be making it as you age, but you can still um, replace them in the body to the level they should have been so the tissues all don't lose out. Your brain doesn't lose out. Your vocal cords don't lose out. Your lungs don't lose out. So progesterone should be robust and um, much more robust. We used to think the average dosing of progesterone was 20 to 50 milligrams a day based on John Lee's work. And I hope I get to meet him up in heaven <coughs> And uh, again. And now we think the dose range is anywhere from 50 milligrams to 2,500 milligrams. It's a much we now know that progesterone should be the largest amount of hormone in your body of any other hormone in your body. We used to think it was testosterone in women. So if you look at the physiology, you often can understand what dosing and levels should be. So is, is that helpful for that? That is. That is really okay. helpful because inevitably <laughs> there'll be questions about what should it be. And just lastly, because I want to be very mindful of your of your time when we talk about progesterone resistance, and, and this is women that will tell me, it doesn't matter whether they take 50 milligrams, 100 milligrams, I'm very sleepy, I don't feel well, even if they take it at night. I know in some of your other work, you've talked about the role of oxytocin, which is a very important hormone. When you're working with women that you've identified that they have some degree of progesterone resistance, when is oxytocin utilization something that you're considering prior to restarting progesterone? What a great question. So my next book that I'm almost done with is Oxytocin, and I've Ooh, been threatening to publish it soon, but I was angsting over the name, but it's almost done. <clears throat> so when the corpus luteum makes progesterone, it makes oxytocin at the same time. So they're closely intertwined, and progesterone is the hormone as we started this talk <clears throat> the pregnancy and oxytocin then squeezes the uterus to propel the baby out. It's a contractile hormone and it also squeezes the breast to let the milk down. So, but it does many, many, many other things like your whole entire pancreas and all your islet cells are covered with oxytocin receptors. Your whole digestive tract is covered with oxytocin receptors. So oxytocin has many, many hats that very few people understand. We just think of it as a pregnancy hormone or an orgasm hormone because it's a bonding hormone and women make more oxytocin if they orgasm with someone they care about and love, not if friends with benefits or masturbation, but you make more of it when you're really with somebody you have emotionality with. So women have a harder time with friends with benefits because they make more oxytocin. And even though the guy says, look, we're just friends, I'm in an ethical non-monogamous relationship. So just keep that straight, man, woman. And, and then the woman gets attached because she makes more oxytocin. But, um, Progesterone is the most, you can be allergic or reactive is the more accurate term to anything. You could be reactive to peanuts and dairy and people know about that, but you can be reactive to hormones. And 
Progesterone is the most reactive hormone there is, and I don't know why that is. But if you go into PubMed, which is a free service put on by our NIH, the National Institute of Health, every person can go in there and search all the peer review abstracts, and some of them give you the whole articles for free. So anytime you should do that more than Google, but know that a lot of peer review is still bought and sold by Big Pharma too. But if you put in progesterone, I go to pubmed.gov, P U B med, med.gov, and put in progesterone and allergy and click search. And 65 articles on progesterone induced autoimmune dermatitis pop up because progesterone, and there's no other hormone that has that allergic profile and published peer review data that progesterone has. Now, why that's the case, I don't know. And I'm hoping to figure that out before my expiration date. <laughs> So it's a good question, but we do know that it is the most reactive. So just like we can desensitize your body to peanut or dairy, you know, if you go to a great allergist, you get allergy shots and it's desensitizing you over time. So for a number of years, I desensitized my patients through the collaboration of my mentor, Dr. Jonathan Wright, and he had a desensitization long distance program. And he just retired. He's not well. Another sadness is that many of my colleagues close to my age don't happen to be as well as I'm enjoying at the moment. So I, my heart goes out to them. But that service is no longer available. And I've actually tried, I got in touch with an allergy company here in Austin, and we tried to create some way that we could desensitize women to progesterone. And we, could, it, we couldn't do what Dr. Wright had made available. So I had a number of women who took progesterone, and they didn't feel well, or they got too drowsy, it made them feel worse. And then they get desensitized and then suddenly they can handle progesterone. So we know it's a reactivity. Now you don't, most women are able to get over it and there is a acupressure treatment that some people can use called um, Nabutropod Allergy Treatment Elimination Program, N-A-E-T or N-A-T-E. I don't know exactly the, it was started by Nabutropod is her name. That's why the first letter is N. And she started out as a smart chiropractor, and then she became an MD. And, and David Brownstein uses that treatment in his office to desensitize to other things, but also hormones. And But when I now send out people to acupuncturists that do this or chiropractors, they end up putting them on a year program. And that's not what you need. You only need a few treatments just to desensitize to hormones. Or sometimes we test the bases because there's a wide variety of bases that you can choose to put the hormone connected to, to, to topically put it or put it in your vagina or... Um, whatever way you want to apply it. For example, there's a brand new base for men that really helps testosterone go in called a trevis. But uh, so I think if I was back in a brick and mortar practice, I would be using the Nabutropod technique at the moment until we come up with something different. But if you really want to take hormones and you... Act, so Carol, that I should, before I go into that, Carol, who was the pharmacist that also taught in everything hormones. She said that if you really have reactions, you're just not taking enough and you should push through it. I'm not a big fan of that. And I don't think many, I have patients that come in and say, I felt so badly when I took progesterone, I'll never take it again. And I don't really want to tell that patient, you should take more and push through it. <laughs> so if you take testosterone and oxytocin, you can balance out estrogen well, but I just don't know if you're still protecting the uterine lining in the same way. That's the big deal is we knew from the 70s there was an explosion of endometrial cancer and they added progesterone. If you use testosterone and oxytocin as the balancer of estrogen, are you still getting that endometrial protection? It's not going into overdrive of growth. And I there's no studies on that that I'm aware of so you can't really give estrogen to a woman with a uterus 
at the, you know, we, we just had an article published in peer review a few months ago that it isn't just uterine cancer that increases if you apply estrogen unopposed without progesterone. It's even ovarian cancer because progesterone protects against multiple cancer cell lines. So much so that that preoperative study that I just talked about that women with robust amounts of progesterone before breast cancer surgery do better over the next two decades. They now realize that before almost any cancer surgery, progesterone protects against glioblastoma, progesterone protects against ovarian cancer. Progesterone is so anti-carcinogenic, it's kind of mind boggling. So I would try and get that patient desensitized to see if we can. And then if we couldn't, then I think I would focus on estriol, which is one eighth the potency of estradiol and testosterone and oxytocin and just hold off on estrogen because estrogen and progesterone give you a safer breast and safer uterus. But it is the bane of all hormone doctors that a bunch of women don't do well with progesterone. So um, we're working on it. it. In the interim, I would say work with um, Nabutropod. It's an acupressure system that helps desensitize you to things. And I've seen it work. Dr. Brownstein has seen it work in his practice. And if that doesn't work, you might need to go to other hormones because you do want to avoid estrogen by itself without progesterone to protect your ovaries and your uterus. And there's probably other things that we don't even know yet that the combo job of both protects. Well, Dr. Berkson, it has been such a pleasure. I hope I can entice you to come back on the podcast again. Please let listeners know how to connect with you outside of this podcast, how to purchase your books or work with you directly. Well, first of all, it's been lovely being in this conversation with you. You're so intelligent and you're a Buddha calmness to you <laughs> and this lovely you. voice. And you're so beautiful externally as well as internally that it's been really pleasurable for me to have this conversation with you. And it's always wonderful to share this information because there's so much misinformation. So if you if you like my stuff, you can go to my website, drlindsayberkson.com, D-R-L-I-N-D-S-E-Y-B-E-R-K-S-O-N.com. And um, you can become a patient. You can go down to the consult. But I do not see very many people. The first visit where I go over your lab, spend time and write up these huge notes for you is about three hours worth. So it's got a, a big price point on it. And you can also scroll all the way down on that first page. If you want to look and see what we taught at Everything Hormones, you can click on Everything Hormones. There's David Brownstein's picture and myself. And we, we take you through everything that's offered and even the materials, the bonus materials. Um, there's a number of free videos. I have lots and lots of podcasts and blogs, but also I have a membership and the membership is called Smart Plus Heart. And I have several levels of that. And one level is Substacks, where I write in Substacks six days a week. And I keep you up on what's happening in hormone land, nutrition land. My books are on Amazon. A lot of them are out of print, but you can still like Healthy Digestion the Natural Way, you can get used online. But there's more coming out. So you can look on my website or look on Amazon. Thank you for the gift that you are. It's been such a pleasure to connect with you. And as I stated before, I hope that I can entice you to come back. And for listeners, I don't give out my email address easily. And I have been subscribed to your email list. And it's just such a wealth of information. You're so gracious and so humble and so generous to share as much as you do. So thank you for the work that you do. Hey, if you like this video, you guys are going to love this video and I'll see you there. We make almost all of our fat cells during childhood and puberty. And then once we finish puberty, we're done. That number of fat cells in most people, there are some people who are an exception to this, and that's about 15% of people who are in the obese category, but most people reach a limit and that's their fat cell number essentially for adulthood.